So last night on February 8th, the Kansas City Star released a bombshell article that IHOP KC founder Mike Bickle was sexually involved with his children's babysitter, Tammy Woods, when she was 14 years old. He was in his late 30s and early 40s. Warning, this video has sexually explicit material. It's not appropriate for children. So Tammy gives details of the sexual encounter. She said this, he had never had sexual intercourse with me, but he did lay on top of me and move on top of me until he released, she said. Mike, she was only 14 years old. What were you thinking? This is a different type of depravity, worthy of Mike never being released into public ministry again. Hi, my name's Joshua Simone, and my ministry is called Torn Curtain which is a media company with the goal of reaching 1 billion people with the gospel message. It called Torn Curtain because when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, the temple in the curtain in the temple curtain torn from top to bottom, signaling our ability to have direct access into God's presence through Jesus' death and resurrection. So I'm going to go over Tammy Wood's account in this video and go over some other things that must be addressed. Even people who are defending Mike Pickle have now turned on him because of this report. Many high-profile leaders were defending Mike up to this point, saying he was innocent. It's really discouraging that so many leaders decided to say that Mike was innocent. Let me play a clip here from Rick Joyner. I may add, when it is revealed, and I think it needs to be revealed now, because it is already public. And if you don't give people the truth, they're gonna speculate on worse things. But I think what we're gonna say, that is such a nothing burger. I can't believe. So you hear seeing Rick Joyner say that this is gonna to amount to be a big nothing burger. Well, Rick, I hate to tell you, but this has turned into a something burger. Now, Mike has admitted to less intense sexual activity with Jane Doe No. 1 in his public apology letter. Then last week, the investigation with IHOP's law firm, Lapthrop, revealed the second J. Doe from the early 2000s in which Mike engaged in sexual misconduct. So now there's two situations. Now, because of last night's article, now Mike is guilty a third time, and this time with his 14-year-old babysitter. I can't even imagine that I'm making a video like this right now. I'm just totally bewildered. Another thing that is not being addressed is the first case with Jane Doe number one involved a possible date rape. This is why IHOP had to take a legal approach in the first place. This is something that seems to be being swept under the rug. Let's play Eric Voltz's clip. He was... A, their public spokesman through the whole entire scandal, but has now stepped aside. He made a video this week to talk about his experience. So, uh, Jane Doe, she gave an exclusive interview and kind of told her whole story. At the time, though, that wasn't known, that wasn't public. But date rape is rape in the first degree, and there's no statute of limitations on date rape. We also knew that someone very close to the main alleged Jane Doe had consulted an attorney and asked, how do you prove a date rape mm -hmm. happened 25 years ago? And, you know, so that was one of the things that, like, kind of thrust this from IHOP's perspective into kind of, we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mike needs to obviously be careful, but because the allegations were being presented to the organization, you know, they had a legal obligation to make sure that the executive leadership knew about it. Um, and that's when they, you know, they started to consult attorneys, too. Well, thanks for reminding us, Eric, now that you mentioned that, because the, the investigation that Laptop did totally never even addressed the fact that there's a possible date rape here. This is why IHOP KC must have a real and true third-party investigation that works with the support of the advocate group because there's much more here to be uncovered. Actually, the truth is being uncovered anyway without an investigation. So why not just do the right thing? And here we are months into this situation and they haven't done the right thing. Now we have multiple Jane Doe's. 
and a possible rape that got swept under the rug. Why am I still doing these videos? Because a lot of people question my motives, okay? I'm not a big YouTube star or anything like that, getting 100,000 views. These videos don't make money. As a matter of fact, I lose money doing this, okay? Because it takes so much time and effort and energy that it's basically a loss. I do this because I want to see the truth come to light. I'm still doing these videos because Mike has not yet fully repented. Even his repentance letter was just a partial repentance and didn't acknowledge these other situations. Mike has been in hiding since his first apology letter. And Mike has not apologized to any of the Jane Doe's. And IHOP hasn't apologized to any of the Jane Doe's in Mike in Mike's standing as Mike's proxy. IHOP has not had a true third-party investigation. IHOP has not fully acknowledged the seriousness of this situation. IHOP has yet to apologize to the community. They basically want to get back to ministry at this point. But I have to be honest. I don't think they want the truth to come to light. And I think it's in our nature to run from unpleasant realities. So I'm thinking that they're just trying to move on at this point. But I'm hoping that so many people will not let them until a true third-party investigation happens. I know I'm not letting them off the hook until this happens. I have never in a million years thought I'd be covering stories like this. My journey first started with local churches in my area here in New York City. Several churches that I was involved in in leadership. And I saw behind the scenes. What I saw behind the scenes made IHOP even look healthy. It was just dysfunctional wherever I went. In some cases, the churches were like the mafia, and you were wondering which staff member was going to get whacked this week and disappear, and there would never be a statement. There would never be an acknowledgement of what happened and took place. We just try to go back into ministry, right? Go back to just preaching the gospel. Then I started to be released into ministry, into media ministry. And now my channel has grown and I've reached over 5 million people. I have exposure to the top ministries and churches in America. And I had uncovered a trail of dirt that has lasted for miles and miles and miles. I find dirt wherever I went in this investigation. And I'm not looking for this stuff, guys. This stuff fell into my lap. And then I had to be determined, am I going to speak up on this or am I going to stay quiet? I've not been able to even process all of it. It's just so overwhelming. I could literally put dozens of ministries and pastors out of business in a snap of a finger because people have emailed me from all over the world. Guys, we are living in the end times. We must be careful in the church that you go to and what ministries that you support. However, I want to state that there are still plenty of good churches out there and good pastors. But you have to be wise in how you choose these pastors and ministries because the days are getting darker and deception is rampant and false prophets are abundant. And so we've got to be really wise and discerning, especially if you have a whole family and they're at a church. You want to spend a lot of time saying, Holy Spirit, is this the right church for me and my family? But the Holy Spirit made it clear to me that this is the ministry that needs to be done right now. Uncovering all of this dirt that I found. Many would just say, just preach the gospel. But with sickness like this in our churches, preaching the gospels wouldn't be appropriate. We must worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, not just in spirit. And I am 100% convinced that this is the, one of the most important ministries to be a part of right now. I love the Church of Jesus Christ, and I know that we can do much better than this, guys. I want the Church to be all it can be. I'm not doing this for clicks. I'm not doing this for, for money or anything like that. Jesus said he's coming back for a spotless bride, so cleansing must first come to the Church. As Peter says, Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. I believe God wants to move to his church one last time before he returns, but he must do some house cleaning first. If God's glory started moving right now, there might be a lot of dead people. Think about Ananias and Sapphira dropping dead because they had lies beneath the surface that were covered up. But the Holy Spirit saw it all and struck them dead as a result of Peter's prophecy. I am determined to be like a Martin Luther in this generation, a Jehu that slays Jezebel. 
But many don't realize that the Reformation happened only because Martin Luther started speaking out on the corruption in the church. I'm sure many people told Luther to be quiet, not to gossip, not to speak bad about his brethren. But thank God he spoke up. And I will continue to speak up. And I'm, no one is going to silence me now but God himself. And I explained in my last video the crazy realization that I came to recently. When I thought that I needed to preach to sinners and to the world. Until I realized the church probably needs the gospel more. Since few have been really preached the true gospel of repentance in this generation. Because we got this Mickey Mouse, gummy bear, watered down version of Christianity. Which is this seeker sensitive version where nobody is told the real truth. Now let's get into this Tammy Wood story. Kansas City Star dropped this article late last night. <clears throat> and I was just reading it just deeply grieved because several people had reached out to me. I have friends all over the world now, all over the United States, um, some high-level church leaders, some just regular people that are watching the ministry. But, you know, my phone started blowing up and people telling me, did you see the, did you see the, did you see the article? Did you see the article? And I just, I almost didn't even want to look. But let's get into it here. Okay, so this is a Kansas City newspaper. Woman says founder of Kansas City International House of Prayer sexually abused her when she was 14 in the 1980s. In Michigan, a woman has come forward with allegations that International House of Prayer founder Mike Bickle sexually abused her starting when she was 14, before he formed IHOP. Her allegations, which some say are the most damaging to surface yet, to come forward about Bickle after four decades of silence. And we're going to get into later on why she was silent for so long. She's going to, because that's the main question many people have. Why are they just coming out now? Why did they stay silent? Well, you're going to hear that a little later on. And Tammy is going to explain exactly how this happened, how it came about. And so you're going to want to stick with me here to the end because I think Tammy has a story that needs to be told. And she, this is collaborated by other people, by people in her family, by other people that knew her because they saw what a close relationship she had with Mike Bickle and that he had all this access to her. So this isn't just her telling the story. Other people are collaborating with her, her family. And um, she went to her pastor recently to, to explain about this. But um, Tammy Woods told her story to the Kansas City Star this week exclusively and other newspapers such as this one, this Gazette Extra, picked up on it. Tammy Woods told her story to the Star this week about, how, about her relationship with Mike Bickle. She said the abuse took place in Bickle's car, at her home, in the church, and in his office, and it involves sexual contact, but not intercourse. Okay, so that was familiar to some of these other cases, too. It didn't seem like Mike had full sex with these people, but there was definitely a, a, a huge amount of sexual misconduct. Woods, who is now 57 and is a mother and a grandmother, said she didn't tell anyone for 43 years. But after watching the details unfold about how a woman identify as Jane Doe, whose sexual abuse allegations were made public in October and led to Bickle's removal, Wood said she couldn't keep silent anymore. So she told her husband and some family members and her pastor, and then last Saturday, she called the St. Louis police and filed a report. This is my story. It really happened. I'm not Jane Doe. I am Tammy. And you did this, said Woods, who is using her maiden name to refer to Bickle. But I don't want you to continue controlling the narrative of my life for today, as Mimi, as mom. So she hopes by speaking out that somehow it'll help others. You know what? We don't want to have a life sentence of shadows and lies. We want to be given a script that can, we can be manipulated as some pawns. OK, so she's saying like basically like I was kept quiet, but these lies, I couldn't live with the lies anymore. She was trying to keep it a secret. She was trying to just keep it between her and Bickle. But just the lies caught up with her. 
And so you're going to see how Jane Doe coming forward and being bold made the way for other women to come forward and be bold. So that's why all of these stories are just coming out now. A lot of times it's like the ice has to be broken. And when one person decides to be bold and, and speak out, that others will usually follow them. That's why we'll see like a series of allegations come forward. Just like if, you, if you're watching the rap star Sean Puffy Combs has basically come and several women have come forward just recently stating like this guy has sexually abused me, groomed me, and these things happened for years. Bickle, when contacted her by email several times on Wednesday, did not provide a comment. So they reached out, the newspaper reached out to Mike, and again, he's no comment, he's MIA, we don't know where he is. But IHOP's attorney, Andrew Minato, said on an email on Wednesday that the organization did not know about Woods until this broke in the newspaper. Information coming from another individual claiming to be the victim of sexual misconduct by Mike Bickle remains a deeply disturbing theme, Mamano said. We note that while the time frame and the claim misconduct is more than 40 years ago and decades before IHOP was even in existence, these claims still resonate. We have immediately reported this information to Rosie Nakanara, independent investigator of the Bickle allegations. Last week, McInara issued a report findings of her investigation, which concluded that Bickle more than likely than not engaged in inappropriate behavior that included sexual contact and clergy misconduct. The behavior was an abuse of power. So Bickle issued his first statement. He's 68 years old on December 12th, saying that he had sinned and admitted to inappropriate behavior that occurred more than 20 years ago. The primary accuser, Jane Doe, said in the interviews first reported by the Roy's report that this abuse happened from 1996 to 1999 when she was 19 and Bickle was 42. So again, it seems like Mike Bickle liked, liked the young ones, for instance. And, you know, since he was in a position of power, people really look up to you. You know, I've been a youth pastor, young adult pastor, working in college ministry as well. And these people, they really look up to you. You're like a god in their world. And they're really, they're really trusting you. They're really vulnerable with you. They'll follow your leadership. Um, and so that's important. That plays into role here because a lot of people will contact me and say, Josh, but what about the women in this? Do they hold any responsibility? Yes, the women do hold some responsibility in this. But the truth is, is especially if they're minors, and Mike Bickle really took advantage of his position of authority, and he is shares a lot more responsibility in all of this. Okay, so um. So the article is going to get into here. Um, so Tammy is going to explain here in this article that all of this started with babysitting. OK, so she started becoming Mike's babysitter. Wood said she first met Bickle in the su summer of 1980. When her and her family started attending the South Christian School. Right. And then so basically Bickle then asked her if she was interested in doing some babysitting. He had two kids at that point. Soon after, Woods said that Bickle contacted her at her uncle's veterinarian clinic. At that time, I was the most shy 14-year-old you could imagine, a straight-A perfectionist student. I had never been on a date before. I was so intimidated. I just remember feeling so overwhelmed, right? Because, again, Mike is this famous international minister. But Bickle asked her if she knew Jesus, and she said, basically, not really. And no, so he said him and his wife went on dates every Monday, and they would love her for her to babysit. So she started babysitting on Monday nights, and Bickle would pick her up at her home. He began to disciple her. He bought her a Bible, and they began to pray and minister with her and started, you know, she says, started mentoring her in all sorts of spiritual things. He gave her books to read about missionaries and revivalists, and he was actually really coming alive in those things. And she decided to, to accept Christ into her life and became a Christian. So he gave her her first Bible, and then she, he kind of wrote something slightly inappropriate in the Bible. And then Diane, Mike's wife, said, Mike, you can't write those type of things in the Bible. So he took the Bible out and, and, and wrote something a little more generic. So basically, 
Bickles would then start to drive her home from church and youth group on Saturday nights. Her parents never caught on to something was wrong, right? Because in the same sense, they, they were trusting her too. But around the time she started entering her freshman year of high school, Wood said Bickle was driving her home one night and then he pulled over his yellow Volkswagen rabbit off the road. And he said, I just want to talk to you for a minute. I have a question for you. Do you feel something for me more than a friend? And she said, you know, my heart was racing and everything like that. And he, she said, oh, my God, you know, he's going to he's going to really confront me because she, he knows I have a crush on him. But basically, then Bickle goes, well, you know, do you know that I feel the same for you? Now, Bickle discloses his feelings for this 14 year old and she was just so caught off guard. She didn't really know how to respond. All I can say was, I don't know. Well, I do, he said. I have feelings for you. And that was the turning point. He was not physical or anything that night. It was just a declared statement. Something shifted between them. So she said school, high school started that year and Bickle wanted her to call him on her lunch hour. And so she would make the f calls on pay phones. But the thing is, she had to just hide and lie from her friends and different people in her life about who she was calling because they were asking her questions. And so she started calling him on her lunch break and different things in between classes. And she started to notice, like, my, my, my sur social circle is starting to pick up on this. So she says things started to progress. They used to hold hands. This was all while she was 14, by the way. He would hold hands. He would hold her, embrace her, and play with her hair. He told her he loved her. And a few times said, Bickle mentioned something that had surfaced is a common thread among other women. So Bickle is now going to give this lie that was sh showed by the advocate group that he used over and over again, a prophetic story that his wife Diane was going to die and basically right, Bickle was going to be in a position to remarry. So it was one of those conversations where he told this girl the same thing. He's using the same line. So Bickle said he first she first kissed Bickle at her home on a Saturday morning when no one else was around. She was 14. He would kiss my neck, he would kiss my cheeks, he would kiss my forehead, she said. But at first, it was like a kiss kiss was in my house. He kind of pulled me into the bathroom and he kissed me like a man kisses a woman. And then things started to progress to fondling and beyond. He never had sexual intercourse with me, she said, but he did lay on top of me and move back and forth until he released. I just want to be very clear because of what he said after the report came out. She said a lot of the reports that Lapthrop had released said that Bickle did not touch anyone. But she's saying here, I want to make it very clear, Bickle was definitely touching me. And he moved my hand to touch him as well sexually. And he did touch me in return. Okay, so there was, you know, the touching was going back and forth. After sexual contact, Wood said, Bickle was always remorseful. Okay, and that was also another trend in all of this in the other cases with the Jane Toes, that it seemed like Mike was really sorry for his sins, became regretful and asked her for forgiveness and asked if they can pray together over this failure. And they kept saying, he kept saying, we can't do this again, but just kept going into this. And they kept having these occurrences through the years. And this lasted for years. I mean, she's even in college and different things, and they're still in contact. So basically, you know, she said she was more of like a, a, a people pleaser. So she kind of went along with this. And as a teenager, she just didn't really have the confidence to go back and forth. She said, I never dated anyone before this happened. I never had a boyfriend. And now this, you know, this older man is putting things in my locker at school and surprising me and would pick me up at the bus stop or my friend's house. And... I not only feel like I lost him and this huge person in my life, but his community as well, because Beckel eventually ended up moving to Kansas City. But she remained silent about this relationship. She said, I made a vow to him of my own little young heart that I would cover him until the grave. Over the years, she would still have that conversation. You know I'm safe, right? To the grave. So she would tell him that. So then she goes on to college, and basically it seems like... um. Basically, uh, 
Bickle drove up to see her a couple of times at college. And now I'm just starting to see, how did other people not see this? They got this minister that's picking her up at school, hanging out with her, now going to visit her in college. How did everybody not see what was clearly going on right here? And then she transferred school again, and um, Bickle visited her once again. They ended up lying on her bed, fully clothed with him on top, and this was the last sexual contact they had. Woods got married in 1988, and Bickle said he couldn't attend the wedding because it was just too painful, but Bickle's um, wife and kids turned the trip. So she gets married, and Bickle cuts, is, decides to cut things off with her and said, listen, I can't, contact, I can't be in contact with you anymore. And then he moves back to Kansas City. But what she, what she said was that's around the, the time when Bickle starts developing that relationship with Jane Doe, number one. So he breaks off contact with her and then starts up this relationship with another young woman. Bickle, she said that Bickle and her had no contact for five years. She continued to keep the secret because he's doing all of these amazing things. But he literally had a get out of jail free card right with me because I had made this promise to him. Now he's growing in no, notoriety and he's becoming this anointed teacher. So I'm thinking, well, you know what? Like, I can't tell anybody. So Rick Bickle returned to St. Louis in 2001, Wood said, with a group from IHOP KC to discuss a vision for a house of prayer in their areas. Then, then they called him Uncle Mike, she said, because there was infection. He honored me publicly. He honored my family. She felt that they could be distant friends, co-laborers in a similar ministry. So that this girl starts getting involved in a house of prayer. It seems like she's still involved with it to this day. Now there's going to be another woman, Barbie Thompson, said she and Tammy met when they were four years old and they quickly became kindred spirits and souls. So someone else is going to collaborate this story, how they were shocking, how they felt a little off about this whole situation. Now Mike was so close to her. And then this woman, Bobby Thompson, realizes that Mike just had captivated everybody and just had such a big personality that he was able to kind of, you know, go undetected. He had this energy about him. He was using these words and he was on fire for the Lord and people just really seemed to be drawn towards him because of this. Okay, so now we're going to move fast forward to 2020 where Woods and her husband moved from St. Louis, Michigan where they oversee the prayer room in their local church. Then came October, her supervisor at a church got a FaceTime call with Woods and her husband to let them know that there were serious accusations against Mike. And I was so, def I was so defiant, she said, Woods said. She couldn't believe that Mike would have squandered his get out of jail free card she had given him. But after the call, she sent a text to B a Bickle with three question marks. And he called me and said, there are some people right now who are saying false things about me. So Bickle's here in total denial. So then Mike asked her for forgiveness for things that have happened in the past. And he said, um, she said, yeah, I'm going to forgive you. I'll keep your, your, your story a secret. I'm not going to tell anyone. She said Bickle said to her over the years that, that he begged for forgiveness and asked for forgiveness and he told her and admitted to her, listen, I could go to jail for what I did. And she said, I forgive you. We're on, we're on the other side of this. You don't have to worry. But then this is the turning point for Tammy Wood. She, she realized, she started to read Jane Doe's story and realized, oh my goodness, I was duped. The parallels took my breath away. So like all of the same things that Bickle was saying to Jane Doe, he had said to her. Like he had this code word for her, which was Houston, which stood for Whitney Houston's song, I Will Always Love You. So Mike had his own code words and everything, pretty intelligent when you think about it. And Bickle started reaching out through text messages more frequently now that the allegations broke. And I told him, listen, you don't have to fear me. I don't want to get in on all of this. And then he showed her his harsh statement that he was going to release and uh, to ask her what she thought. So Woods now describes the final moment where she finally decided to come forward because in the past six weeks she had lied to three loved ones that have asked her directly about her relationship with Mike Bickle. So people knew that she was so close with Bickle and they started asking her, hey, did he ever do anything like that with you and stuff like that? 
And all of a sudden, all these years later, he's still controlling the narrative on my life. He's keeping now frequent in communication with her because she realizes he's trying to get her to stay quiet, to make sure she doesn't crack. And she said, this chafes my soul to live as a liar. That is not who I am and not what I thought. I can't do this. And I realized he's doing this to other younger women, all of them. And so I just snapped. So on January 30th, she wrote a letter to Mike and Diane Bickle. And I guess it was more cathartic. She wanted to get her story down. Then she went to see her pastors and told them her story and showed them the letters. She contacted the famous attorney, Boz, the lawyer who is representing the primary Jane Doe, and filed a police report. The officers who took her report said a detective would contact her this week. And she's not expecting much because of the statute of limitations. It just needs to be on the record. Boz is now her legal counselor, said Wood, whose actions were courageous. Tammy has made a profound, bold statement to step forward in truth as she begins to reclaim the narrative on her life that was stolen so many years ago. Her voice gives hope and inspiration to so many abuse survivors who still struggle as they continue to suffer in silence. Wood said that she hated having to get involved in the issue, but knew that she couldn't stay on the sidelines any longer. No one can script your life for you, she said. Nobody can control the narrative of your life. No matter how dark the chapters are, they don't define you. That's when I went to my pastors and said, once upon a time. So here we're seeing this story with Mike Bickle that happened over many years and continued with Tammy into college, started when she was only 14 years old, being their babysitter, and they're kissing and fondling each other and sexual conduct. So now this is three different Jane Doe's that she was involved with, and Tammy put her name to this, unlike the other Jane Doe's, and came forward. So she should be commended for that. I'm sure this was very hard for her to do. It seemed like Mike Bickle and her had a good relationship up to the end, but she just decided I couldn't live in the lies anymore and other people need to know about this and came forward. So yeah, I'm just going to close tonight. And uh, just uh, before I do, I just want to close in a word of prayer. Okay, because the thing is, is like some of this stuff is just so hard to ingest. We want to bring the truth to light and we want to do that in a graceful way. Okay, so I try to always use a grace truth balance in all these videos. You want to give grace where that's appropriate, and you also want to hold truth when that's appropriate and speak those and hold both of those intention. Okay, if it's all grace, then it's just fluff. If it's all truth, then it's abusive. But if you use both of them side by side, it's the way that Jesus Christ communicated in the Gospels tell us to communicate that way, to have all of our talk be seasoned with grace. But the truth is, is that it seems like Mike is a serial abuser. This is very serious, and now it's including minors. And so we have much larger issues to face in the church, and we need to start talking about sex in the church. This is something we need to talk about much, much more. And I know in one big popular church that I was a part of, they would talk on, they would give a sex sermon once a year. But the truth is, is we really need to start talking about this more because it's such a big part of who we are. And if the church isn't talking about this, it allows everything to just be left up to our personal lives and for us to navigate this all by ourselves. But it's time for the church to start taking this issue of sexuality head on to begin to talk about these things. And it doesn't matter how anointed you are. You can be subject to the flesh. You could be subject to, to your sexuality and taken down on, on a rabbit trail. I'm sure Mike didn't get into ministry to get involved in stuff like this. I believe that Mike had a good heart when he entered ministry and really wanted to help people, but because of unresolved issues and different things, the enemy was really able to take his life and have him get sexually involved with several people. And now look, we have this mess all these years later, and now this ministry will probably not survive all of this, okay? And so the enemy wants to destroy and, and kill and cheat. And but but Jesus Christ has come that we might have life and have it to the full. 
So there is hope here. So I just want to just close in a prayer because through making these videos, it, it could just, you can get so slimed because you're ingesting these negative stories, the truth of this situation, and you become delusion, disillusioned. You can become calloused and hardened of heart and just begin to develop a mentality like, well, this is just happening every place. I shouldn't even go to church anymore. I'll just stay home and watch church in my own house. You can't trust anyone anyway. No, the truth is we need to deal with the, the truth of this situation to look this dragon in the face and at the same time say, God, we need your grace to continue in all of this. So let me just close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. Our Father in heaven, our Father. That's the way you want us to approach you, as a loving father. As a strong father who's taking care of everything. And despite everything that's going on in IHOP right now, God, you are still on the throne. You are still in charge. None of this is shaking you at all. You are completely in control. And you hold all the galaxies in motion in the palm of your hand. And you still have amazing plans for, this ch for the church. That the finest days of the church are coming ahead. But Lord, that you wanted the ugly, these ugly truths to come to the surface. Not so we could come disillusioned. Not so that we can lose faith. But God, that our faith can be refined. Grief and pain and sadness do not have to make us less. They can make us more. They could expand us into new realities. And so, Lord, in the midst of all of this, this terrible reporting, we ask that you would just renew us day by day in your word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would revive us and assure us that you're still alive and acting. You want to use us as agents of change in this world. And God, although there are, there are, these terrible situations that happen, you still have a remnant that have not bowed their knee to bail. You still have your faithful servants and your good churches out there. And so, God, we ask you to help just renew our mind to the truth, to whatever's good and whatever's trustworthy and whatever's praise, to, to focus on these things. God, to be healed so that we can move forward and in these last days begin to just continue to have you working in us and through us in the world. That there is still hope that as long as we still have a pulse, as long as we are still here on earth, that you have a plan and a work for us to do. And God, that we're going to be busy doing that until you come. And so we thank you and praise you tonight just to renew us and to leave us with hope that as long as you are on the throne, there is hope. That as long as we are still alive, you have plans and purpose for us. And we want to fix our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So thanks for listening tonight. I appreciate it. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Please comment if you're watching, especially if you're watching from another country. Let me know where you're watching from. I'd like to see who's watching the videos. If you want to support the channel, you can find out more about that in the description below the video. So I can continue to make contact like this in the future. And I appreciate it. Be blessed and encouraged. Thank you for watching tonight.